Therapy Chat Podcast, Episode 77. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and today we are going to talk about a very interesting subject, which you may have heard about or you may not. Before speaking with today's guest to talk about her being on Therapy Chat, I had not heard of this concept. And I feel like it's for me, the name was a little bit controversial at first. So we're talking today about a subject called covert emotional incest. My guest is Adina bank who is a clinical social worker in Arizona and an internationally recognized speaker, author, trainer, and consultant. Adina has 25 plus years of clinical psychotherapy and advanced trainings in a variety of disciplines and approaches. She has helped develop programs and she specializes in traumatic stress and childhood sexual abuse. But the subject that Adina is here to speak about today, covert emotional incest, is one that many people are not familiar with. I specialize in working with people who've experienced childhood sexual abuse, and I only knew the term incest to refer to family sexual abuse. So I at first thought that the idea of emotional incest was somehow detracting from the experience of people who had experienced sexual incest. And Adina explains why I was wrong in that misunderstanding and how covert emotional incest is just as harmful to those who experience it as the sexual abuse that we're more familiar with. So I think this is going to be a really interesting episode for you to listen to, and I hope you will enjoy my conversation with Adina bank Lees. So let's go ahead and get started. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. Today, I have a very interesting subject and a very special guest to present to you. My guest today is Adina bank Lees, LCSW, a therapist in Tucson, Adina, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Laura. It's my pleasure. Excited about it, actually. I am too. You and I connected because you have a a very interesting specialty that had been new to me when I first learned about it. You know, I'm still not, I'm still learning about it. It's the subject of covert emotional incest. So can, can you talk a little bit about yourself, first of all, for our audience and your work, and then we'll talk a little bit more about what covert emotional incest is. Absolutely. Thank you for that opportunity. So uh, I'm a native New Yorker who moved to Tucson back in 1990 to work at a premier treatment center, drug and alcohol and trauma treatment center. And grateful for that experience. It really opened my eyes and taught me a lot. Uh, One of the things that I say to anybody who's listening, who's a new therapist, who's getting into the trauma field, is that you're going to learn most of what you need to learn after you graduate. And the other is that it's really important for you to know why you got in the field. And the reason I say that, and I'll speak a little bit about me. So being a covert incest, a a thriver with a covert incest history, and that's what I call myself now. We'll talk a little bit about that, too. I learned so much about why I got into the field when I, after I graduated and worked at this treatment center and worked some other places, my role was to, was to fix and to make sure everybody was okay. And so I couldn't fix my parents and I couldn't fix their marriage. And so it was, wow, if I could fix other people, maybe this hole inside of me will get filled. 
Mm-hmm. And until I had that awareness, Laura, I was trying to fix people and I was giving advice. And that's absolutely not what I believe a trauma therapist or any psychotherapist or counselor is hired to do, even though a lot of clients want that, you know. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so that just tells you a little bit about my background, about how I got here. And my work has been a combination of private practice, of agency work, and training and consulting uh, around the country and around the world on this topic, as well as on the neurobiology of trauma uh, and sexual abuse using action methods. I'm a psychodramatist, a certified psychodramatist. So when I present, I do not, I do not have a PowerPoint. Uh, it is all about engagement and experience. And that's what I do as well with clients, uh, really moving them into experiences rather than just talking. So I don't want to go so much into that. But um, so I've been a social worker and a substance abuse counselor since 89 or 90, a uh, certified psychodramatist, I think for about three years. I've studied psychodrama since 89. So I always had a joke that I said, you know, I need to raise my son before I go for certification because it's quite a rigorous process. And just so happens when my son started college about five or six years ago, I studied for the exam and went through it and, and, and got that certification. It was a lifelong dream for me. So, mm-hmm. yeah, and this covert emotional incest topic we were talking about before, this is my passion because when I was traveling around the country regular basis, 94 to 2004, uh, training on sexual abuse, and I had covert emotional incest as part of the training. That was the piece that people came to me during the breaks and afterwards saying, oh, my God, I never heard of this. You just talked about me. You just described so many of my clients and we couldn't figure out what it was because they didn't have a physical incest history. And yet they had so many of the signs and symptoms of somebody who'd been incested. And we were so concerned because of the false memory syndrome foundation and movement I didn't want to imply anything. I didn't want to say anything, you know, that would lead someone to think that they were physically incested, but they had all the signs and symptoms and the beliefs. And so you just gave us such an incredible context that we could look at this through and not fall into trying to talk somebody into anything. Does that make sense? Yes, exactly. And I I relate to that too, that sometimes people feel like something happened, but they don't know that it did and you would never want to suggest anything to make them think that something happened that they don't know. That's correct. But when someone shows all the signs of having experienced some kind of sexual abuse and they're it's I think it can be very frustrating for people just they they want to understand why they feel the way they do, but they don't have anything to kind of grab onto that explains and you can't help them grab onto it either because you don't know, especially, you know, for me, I had never heard of covert emotional incest. And when I heard about it, I immediately thought, well, incest is sexual abuse. And that is something that is very specific. So to call an emotional experience incest seems like it's taking something away from people who've experienced physical sexual abuse, but you explained to me, it is a type of sexual abuse. It's not just a metaphor or it's not saying it's like. So can you talk more about what covert emotional incest is and how it's how it fits in? Of course. Yeah. And I love that uh, the piece that you brought up in the conversation that we had, and I think we'll continue to have. So there are two or three pieces to covert emotional incest. And the first main piece is that the child jumps up what we call the intergenerational boundary. And that intergenerational boundary is there to make sure we know the power structure of the family and that the parents are the parents (laughs) and the kids are the kids. And the kids have a voice, but they don't necessarily have a vote in everything. And that the parents are there to set appropriate limits so that the kids feel safe. And the kid's job is to follow those and then begin to test those, right, as soon as they hit two or a year and a half (laughs) and don't don't stop testing them, right? Right. So 
a lot of people we were talking before also about what's the difference between parentified, and we can say parentified child is not sexually abused. That is correct. So when I say jump up the inter- intergenerational boundary, I mean as a peer, not as a parent, as a peer. And so the child is used as a surrogate or substitute spouse. So an emotional affair, you've probably, people have heard about an emotional affair when one of the partners shares intimately details and emotions with somebody else, another adult. They never touch physically and have a physical affair, but they have an emotional affair. And in working with couples, Sometimes that can be even more damaging than a physical affair because the partner can say, well, good, you can have sex with somebody else, but your heart is still with me. Right. Well, that's not true in an emotional affair. (laughs) Your heart and your intimate life goes to somebody else. And that's what's happening here is your heart and your intimate life goes to your child and you use your child as, as that emotional affair, as that substitute spouse. So The child, it's very confusing. The child's forced to meet those emotional and the romantic needs and that sexual energy gets passed to that child. And that's what's confusing because it feels icky. It feels yucky. It feels like you've been slimed. It feels like somebody's hands have been on you and they haven't. The other part, and I just want to say the other part that feels yucky and that people's hands and eyes are on you for covert covert emotional incest is the objectification of the body and the focus on the body. What people are saying there with what feels off, that's what covert emotional incest looks and feels like. You've said it so beautifully, so beautifully, yes. And it feels off. And then what does that mean? And without a context, it's it's crazy making. It's, and that's, that was my experience, and that's a lot of my clients' experience, feeling very crazy because there's no, there's no memory or physical touching, physical contact that you could say, oh, yeah, I was incested, right? That's what we usually think. I was incested, which means physical touching of some sort or penetration. It's like, mm, that didn't happen, so it must be something else. It must, must be about me. And that's one of the signs and symptoms is that I'm crazy and I must be crazy. Right, right. So I can't point to anything that my parent did wrong. So there must be something about me that's wrong because why do I feel like this? Exactly, exactly. And if there's, um, I'll just give you an example again in my family. We were a very close family and sometimes too close, which is the piece, the setup for emotional, covert emotional incest. But physically, I come from a New York, you know, East Coast Jewish family. And so very demonstrative, very affectionate. And there was kissing on the lips with my father and myself and my mother and my aunt, my uncle. And And as I got older into my adolescence and there was no tongue kissing and none of that stuff, it still felt, um, this isn't right. This boundaries again, these boundaries are being blurred, but it must be something about me because it was a norm in my family and nobody else seemed to be bothered by it. Yeah. That's a great example. And so it's something that someone may feel, oh, well, you know, that's not really such a major thing. But for the person who feels kind of gross and dirty when doing what their family normally does, and they can't understand why when everyone else thinks it's okay, and they feel disgusted by it or just uncomfortable, it feels inappropriate. There's just no way to name that. So I think that's why this conversation is so important. And I appreciate, again, how what um, I'm speaking and then you're really summarizing and boiling it down to say it so well. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, welcome. So um, what are some, if if there are any kind of succinct ways to explain what a family looks like that has covert emotional incest, what would be some of the, you know, dynamics that you could notice if you look back? You could notice that you felt like the confidant that mom or dad were confiding in you about things they should have been talking to either a peer, a professional, or their partner. It's like, oh, and still, 
And here's that intergenerational boundary, Laura, because so as a kid, it's pretty obvious I'm not supposed to be giving this advice that there's boundary problems. So here I am at, for me, at 54. So, well, now I'm an adult. You know, my mom is 81. So, you know, the the roles change. You're an adult. You could be best friends with your mother now and, and, you know, and you could be advising her. No, I am still in the daughter role. I will be. (laughs) forever. And my mother is still my mother. So there still needs to be boundaries. And I work with many adults whose mother or father, because it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be father, daughter, it could be mother, mother, I mean, mother, daughter, father, son, that there's still that, that pull to be the friend, the therapist, the confidant. And boundaries have been so critical for myself and my clients to be able to say, this feels uncomfortable. I don't want to hear about this. I don't want to hear about your sex life and the difficulties in your sex life. Think about that overwhelming sexual energy and content for a child. You want, that's, that's part of covert emotional incest. The child cannot process that sexualizing too much um, and can feel really, really yucky. So what does it look like in a family? Let's get back to that. So a confidant, the inappropriate touching or looking, commenting about the body and the kissing on the lips or the hug that's just a little bit too tight, but there's not a concrete piece there, but it feels, again, it feels uncomfortable. Oftentimes we see this dynamic in addicted families, pretty classic that either mom or dad as the alcoholic or addict of some sort are checked out and the partner, the, the other parent is left alone. Mm-hmm. And who does that parent have to turn to? Their children, because they either are very isolated or they've grown up with this. And, you know, we don't ask for help. Typical rules in an alcoholic family are don't talk, don't trust and don't feel. So we don't go outside the family. So any needs that are going to be met are going to be met within the family. And the parent will then, cho- then use the children rather than asking for help, going to a professional. So those are some of the things off the top of my head. And I just want to give two more examples that I I give in the video that I have on my website that I really encourage people to watch. And that is, we have a little boy and he's at his father's funeral. We have a lot of of little boys at their father's funeral with military men coming back and, and even with mother's funerals as well. And so he's at his dad's funeral and we say to him without even thinking, so so sorry about your father. You're the man in the house now. Take care of your mother and your sisters. Mm-hmm. What did we just do? We just set him up as his mother's husband. Yeah. You're the man of the family. Take care of your, what does take care of your mother mean? What, what does that entail? Does, and so all of that stuff that goes unsaid in, in graduate school, we called it meta messages, mm-hmm. right? That we don't know how that gets processed in a child. You know, he's not the man of the house. He is a child that needs to stay a child. Um, The other example was, and this is, this is pretty graphic, is that a a client of mine from a long time ago grew grew up in a family where her father made peepholes in every room of the house so he could watch his wife and his daughters whenever he wanted to. Mm. So my client says to me, I don't get it. He never incested me. You know, he insisted my two sisters. So he fondled and had penetration with her two sisters. And she knew that, but he never touched me. So why do I like them? You know, why can't I establish and maintain a healthy adult relationship? You know, why why do I feel so crappy about myself? Why, Why do I have all these feelings of shame and guilt? And we had to discuss about how being peeped on, being watched whenever he wanted to, and knowing about being a witness to her sister's physical molest, how did that impact her? That's covert emotional incest, too. So it covers different areas. It's covert. It's, it's, it's sneaky. It's insidious. It's intangible. It's permeable. It's, it's slimy. I hope that's coming across in some of the examples I'm giving. Yeah, I think so. I mean, especially with the peepholes, the... The message is you never have privacy. Your body is not your own. I will watch you. I will see you. You can't hide. Yeah. 
Exactly. I control you. Yeah. And those are the messages that the physical incest survivor gets. Your body's not your own. Your body's mine. And I can have you whenever I want. And I have power and control over you. Right. Um, and so, you know, the, the other thing that is similar to incest, uh, physical incest survivors, covert emotional incest survivors often are set up in a role so they feel special mm-hmm. and adult-like. And those are really powerful reinforcers. You know, I'm the one they choose. I'm mature enough, you know, to be able to do this. And, you know, I'm mommy's best friend. You know, we have that in our culture about daughters and mothers being best friends. Mm -hmm. And I'll be really straight up and honest that I never wanted to be my mother's best friend. I wanted her to be my mother. Exactly. And so uh, I cringe, you know, something inside me tightens when I see and I hear that kind of stuff glorified or just normalized Mm -hmm. in, in speaking. So. I'm big on boundaries and appropriate roles. I'll yeah. stop there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the boundaries are what keep, they're, they're there for protection. Exactly. Exactly. They're a border or limit for protection. And that doesn't mean a wall. It means a boundary is something that's, uh, and this is important for clients as well, that they think it's a wall. No, it's something that can move in and out. I can see you. I can see your heart. But I can, it's like a force field. I can move it out when I need to so that your, your emotional space is further away or even physically you're further away. And if I feel more trust, I can bring that emotional boundary and I can open my heart more or you can come physically closer to me uh, to the point where you can actually physically touch me. That's really my inner circle, right? Yeah. So can you talk a little bit more? You've alluded to this and some of the things that you've said, but can you kind of list some of the ways that people who've experienced covert emotional incest might feel so that if someone's listening and they're like, I wonder if this is me, maybe kind of listing it out will help people say this is me or, oh, no, this isn't me. Maybe my situation is a little bit different from this. That's great. Help them to discern it. Yeah. yeah. So this feeling special or adult, adult-like which sets, sets us up sometimes to feel a sense of not belonging because I'm unique, I'm different, I'm not like my peers. Uh, so growing up, did you, you know, did you feel more adult-like and special and then couldn't really relate to your peers? Mm-hmm. Uh, we have often depression, suicidal, homicidal thoughts, uh, attempts. Again, I feel so crazy, I don't know what's wrong with me. Uh, a lot of shame and guilt. To, what I call toxic shame and guilt, because toxic shame and guilt means it's overwhelming me, and it's really it's it's really not even mine. Um, I, uh, healthy shame. I like John Bradshaw's definition of healthy shame. He said the only amount of shame we need is to know we're not God. Mm. So humility equals healthy shame, and toxic shame is I'm so bad, I'm wrong, I'm unlovable, and those are the kinds of things you hear from people with covert emotional incest Uh, and they flip back and forth. I'm really special and I'm better than to, I'm a piece of, you know what? And I'm, you know, I'm unlovable guilt, the same guilt, very important. Let's me know. I have values and a conscience, toxic guilt. I, it's all my fault. Everything's my fault. And that keeps me stuck. Uh, People have post-traumatic stress disorder. And you say, oh, uh, how could that be from emotion, you know, emotional sexual abuse? Well, because of the messages and the energy that gets there, as we were talking about earlier, and the feeling like I'm crazy and the owning of something that's not mine, that's extremely traumatic and can lead to dissociation. So I can feel like I kind of I'm splitting. uh, I like the definition of splitting off or compartmentalizing of my feelings. So I have numbness and I'm shut down. I sometimes, you know, I'm out of my body. My body wasn't mine. It wasn't safe to be in my body. So I leave my body. I watch things from above or I just feel like I'm really not present. I'm separate from eating disorders. So common when I worked inpatient, uh, this was really rampant in the anorexic bulimic population in their family systems. I thought that was very interesting. And as I said also about we see it with addictions, we also see it with chronic medical illness, because again, the spouse is, is who's healthy, sometimes is left alone emotionally and physically, because the person who's ill, the focus is on the illness. And they're not able to be the kind of partner that they were prior to being ill. They don't, maybe they can't be sexual, 
or they can't, um, you know, emotionally they're focused on their illness. They're not as present and they don't, they're not as uh, vivacious in their life. And so there's a lot of loss for the healthy partner. Where do you go with that? How do you get those needs met, set up to go into meeting, using your children? Um, I think one of the biggest things that I see in my practice is the difficulty establishing and maintaining healthy intimacy. And that's both physical and emotional. So I might not realize as a kid, but what I can see now is, yeah, I, I just, I, I can't, uh, I can't do the emotional intimacy. I'm still either connected so much with my mother or father, and it feels like they're right in the middle of my marriage or my relationship. That's something to pay attention to as an adult. Typical, I mean, this is very stereotypical Jewish mother, again, you know, that she's so overbearing that she doesn't let her son go. And there's no girl who's good enough for her son or the daughter as well. You know, there's no man good enough. And we can laugh about that. And you can say that's just a Jewish mother. And you have to look at the impact on that, because if there is a if there is a relationship that is boundaryless or really blurred with the parent, they do get in the middle of the marriage and in the relationship and they don't belong there. So we're talking boundaries again. Yeah, when the mother of the when either of the parents of the partners in a relationship see the other partner as a threat to their relationship with their child, I think that's a red flag. There you go. Again, beautifully said. Red flag. That's right. Uh, Very difficult in receiving from others because their role has been to give, to take care of. And so very difficult to receive love and caring behavior is another red flag. Another red flag is being stuck in the role as caretaker or fixer or mediator or rescuer. If that's the way I know how to relate to somebody, and that's those are the roles that I play, red flag. And it's a red flag for a lot of things. So again, it's about ruling out things. Mm-hmm. So when you said to me, you know, can we talk about the difference between covert emotional incest, parentification, and codependency. I say, you know, these are all, these are all things that can be signs and symptoms of a lot of different problems. So we don't jump to a conclusion. We have to take an inventory, have to do good interviewing and questioning and helping people look at their genogram. A genogram is really a, a wonderful tool for this and talking about the roles that they felt like they were playing. I do a lot of family sculpting. And I'll have each each member of the family sculpt the dynamic of what they saw. And I'll tell you, that is really, really powerful. It's powerful for the person who's the sculptor. They get to show, not just talk about, they get to show their reality. And it's eye-opening and sometimes shocking to see the, the response and the reaction from the other people in the family. Is that a actual sculpting meaning like with clay it is not being a psychodramatist (laughs) we use so that's great i'm glad that you you said something about that anybody who studied with virginia satir she studied with jacob moreno who was the founder of psychodrama which the psychodrama means the soul in action Mm. so rather than telling you about my history uh i'm going to show you and i would show you uh, through, uh, well, let me say this. So Virginia Satir studied with Moreno and then went into what she called family sculpting, which is like a mental snapshot of a family. So I would have, let's say, um, the mother and father, rather than maybe the child would then sit on a chair in between mother and father. Mother and father would be pulling at the child on each end you know, pulling on them. So there's no, not necessarily any speaking. There can be just pulling on that child back and forth. So the child is feeling the, the pull. No, I need you. Oh, I need you. Oh, I need you. That's an example of a sculpt. So it's kind of a moment in time. It's not a big role play, but it's a physical body experience, emotional experience, cognitive experience of what does it feel like to be in this role? And people get it when they like, oh, my God, that's exactly what it felt like. Whoa. And they're, they're looking at it. Yes. Oh, my goodness. That's how she felt. That's what I was doing. Wow. So that's what I mean by sculpting. I didn't think I was thinking with psychodrama. I was like, she's probably not talking about clay. Better check. <laughs> no, I'm glad you did that. Yeah, because this is my language. And so to to make sure that it's accessible to everybody listening, I appreciate that. 
Yeah. And psychodrama is so, so, so powerful. It's, it's really kind of blowing my mind to imagine the way you're working with people and all the stuff you're doing and using psychodrama. And that is, it sounds very powerful and I'm sure very healing for people. It is. And um, I want to say one thing about that. And that is that I do what we're calling trauma informed psychodrama. Mm -hmm. I don't have a trademark for it or whatever, but we know about trauma informed care now and the kinds of very important principles that have to be incorporated into trauma treatment, which are that, you know, everybody has choices. Number one, nobody gets manipulated to control, cajoled into anything and watching a language that we use and making sure the setting is appropriate and making sure that people have skills for nervous system regulation to be able to calm themselves and manage the feelings that come up. So there's a lot of people and maybe not new people, uh, young people in the field, but older people in the field, when they hear psychodrama, they think about almost like primal scream, like you know, yelling and screaming mm. and, and um, you know, these very, very intense feelings. And, and we used to do that. That was like a big deal in the 70s and somewhat in the 80s. And people think of, you know, I have to replay my trauma. Uh, I have to be that victim, that kid victim again in this scene, you know, when we're playing this scene. And I'm like, no, we do not do that. That's re-traumatizing. So psychodrama now is very informed by neurobiology and uh, trauma-informed care. And so we're very careful where people are practicing their self-regulating skills so they're not dissociating. And while they're practicing real-life scenarios and being able to release the feelings that needed to be released that were pent up that caused PTSD and be able to bring it into the now where they have their skills in the now and can be living in the now and move from being a victim to a survivor to a thriver. And that's when I said at the top, when we were talking that I'm a thriver with a covert emotional incest history, because it doesn't define who I am anymore. My process of healing, it did define me for many years. It was important that it did as a survivor. And now I want to pass that on. And so this process of moving from victim to survivor to thriver, I think is critical. And that's that's what I see it as kind of phases of treatment, if you will, that people go through and very much validate that there are phases, stages, not phases, stages to go through. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for explaining that too about psychodrama, because the only way I've learned about it is in the newer way, but I'm not, you know, I wasn't around practicing in the 80s. So, you know, I have heard about primal scream therapy. I didn't know that those two had been associated at one time, but I'm glad you clarified that for anyone who's listening. It's like, oh, oh wait a minute. Right. So, yeah. So, Adina, I not to put you on the spot, but I would love to have you back sometime to talk more about psychodrama because we don't have enough time to go into it more. And right. I have a trillion questions, but this this conversation has been so helpful. And I know you're working on a book about covert emotional incest. Can you talk a little bit more about your book and then where people can find you? Absolutely. So the working title of my book is Maybe I'm Not Crazy After All. And the reason it's titled that is because that was what I felt and said to myself when my therapist at when I was 26 or 27 said to me, what you're describing as you're talking about your family is called, co it was covert incest at that point. And I had never had the context for it. And I, and that was the first thing that popped in like, whoa, maybe I'm not crazy after all. And so my book really is, are going to be, it's a compilation of stories of my life of being that covert emotional incest victim and what the dynamics look like and my experience and my feelings and thoughts and the process of the healing and the components of the healing for me. But rather it be kind of linear, I was born in 1962, and then in 65, this happened in 72. No, it's going to be chapters of stories of main points, like the context and getting the context and boundaries. And we're really working hard on the spirituality chapter, because that's the piece for me that's been such a uh, crux of my healing. And I want people to know about that. 
Uh, and then boundaries, you know, what does no boundaries look like or blurred and what are boundaries look like? So it's going to be a compilation of those stories, which would be educational as well as putting it more in a narrative form rather than classic self-help book giving you kind of theory and then case examples. Mm -hmm. My colleagues have asked me to do it this way because they said we would like to have a book where somebody could read somebody's story and be emotionally connected to it rather than they're reading a self-help book and it feels like they're reading an an academic book for for a class. Clients don't want to do that. They're very, very resistant to that. So that's why I'm writing it in that style. Yeah, I'm sure it will help a lot of people to see themselves and to understand how they can heal too. That's my whole my whole goal. I'm very that's I want people to be able to relate to it in the heart and say, "Wow, so here are the words and the context for what this experience is and the healing part of it." So it's not just identifying it's there is healing, there is thriving. There absolutely is thriving. And here's examples of the way to get there. Yeah, that is so wonderful. And I know that you're going to help so many people with your book and that you already have helped so many people. And I hope for those who are listening that this will be helpful. I think it will. But where can people find you so that they can get more? Because we we just barely got the tip of the iceberg in this conversation. Well, my website adinabanklees.com and I think I don't know if you post anything so they can actually see it I will I'll post a link yes okay so my website and I have a professional Facebook page they can go there it's Adina Banklees and the email is also on my website it's adina at adinabanklees.com so those would be the three I don't give out my phone number on a podcast like this but it is on my website So if somebody wants to call me, I am very, very happy to speak to anyone. I love being a resource, a consultant. I'm doing a lot of consulting and training now in program development, looking to go into treatment centers, mental health and addiction trauma treatment centers to do program development and add covert emotional incest into their programming for clients or patients, and in particular into their family programs, because this is a very important family dynamic that has to be spoken about and dealt with. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, Adina, thank you so much for being on Therapy Chat today, and I look forward to possibly being able to bring you back here sometime. Yeah, let's do another on psychodrama. Would love that. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Laura. Fantastic. Love being with you. Thank you. I loved being with you too. Wow. What a fascinating conversation with Adina Bank Lees. She is so knowledgeable on this subject of covert emotional incest. And I hope that some people who are listening, who maybe are therapists working with a client who has a feeling as if something sexually inappropriate happen to them, but they can't put their finger on any specific incident may be helped by having this additional concept to explain, which may help a client name what is happening for them or what happened for them when they were younger that feels so off. Or if you are someone who experienced something like this and maybe there was never any sexual touching, but there was always this gross feeling that things were sexually inappropriate in your family and you never knew what to call it. Now, maybe this has been helpful for you. And please check out Adina's website, adinabanklees.com and see for more information about that, if that would be helpful to you. As always, thank you for listening to Therapy Chat. We are coming up to the month of April, which is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And throughout my career, it's been a time when we were tying teal ribbons around trees and raising awareness every day of April, giving tons of public speaking presentations to educate people about how to prevent sexual assault. And I don't do that now because I'm in private practice, but It's always on my mind. Of course, sexual assault is something that I specialize in. So I help people affected by sexual assault 
every day, every month, but in April, it's impossible for me to think of April and not think, oh, that's Sexual Assault Awareness Month. So if you are looking for resources for help with sexual assault, um, if you're looking for a therapist in private practice in the Baltimore area, you might want to check out my website, lauraregan.lcswc.com. But Otherwise, feel free to check out rain.org, which is R A I N N dot O R G, to find a sexual assault crisis center near you. And I'll give a shout out to the organization I support through volunteering on their board, which is the Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault. If you're in Maryland, their website is mcasa.org. That's mcasa.org. And they are our statewide coalition helping to advocate for survivors of sexual violence in our legal system, both in the legislature and in the civil courts. And they also support all of the sexual assault crisis centers in the state of Maryland. And there's a statewide coalition in every state. So if that's an issue that you care about, that's a way you can get involved is contact your statewide coalition or your local sexual assault crisis center and find out about how you might be able to volunteer, make a donation, or in some way support their cause. I'll be sure to put links to these websites I'm mentioning in the show notes because I'm very passionate about this issue. Again, whether it's April or June or January or any other month, I'm very passionate about supporting survivors of sexual assault. And I hope that this episode has been helpful to you. Until next time, take care. Hi, I'm Laura Reagan, host of Therapy Chat, and I'm a trauma therapist in private practice outside of Baltimore. I specialize in helping clients with complex trauma related to childhood abuse or loss or attachment trauma during childhood. And I also specialize in helping survivors of sexual assault and childhood sexual abuse. So this is not easy work and it can be very isolating, which is why I created two online communities for trauma therapists. Trauma Therapists Unite is a Facebook group that is secret and only for licensed clinicians. And the idea of Trauma Therapists Unite is a community and space for support and sharing resources getting connected with other trauma therapists, and building your own network of people who support you, whether they're local to your area or not. I've made some great friendships online with other therapists through Facebook, but not all of them are trauma therapists. So I think there's a need for a space where trauma therapists can gather. And then when you want to do clinical consultation, since we can't do that in a Facebook group, You can say, hey, is anybody available at five o'clock to talk on the phone about a tough case I had? Or, hey, I'm available and I would love to support anyone who's seeking consultation today. Or, hey, you're in my area. Let's meet for coffee and brainstorm about our work and share support and connection. So... Trauma Therapists Unite is a free Facebook group for that purpose. It is not for clinical consultation because we cannot share client information in a Facebook group. We all know that. But because of the isolating nature of trauma work, especially when you're in private practice, but in agencies too, it can be very isolating because it's kind of the nature of trauma work. So with that isolating nature in mind, I created Trauma Therapists Unite for us to gather, support one another, and share resources, and I hope you will join us. There is a process to join the group that includes providing information about your credentials, and all of that information is in the group, so when you request to join, you'll see the rules. The other resource that I wanted to tell you about is a paid membership community, the Trauma Therapist Community, which includes online clinical consultation off Facebook using a secure platform 
of video sessions once a month and more if desired. And groups are also available in person. So check my website, lcswc.com slash join for all the information about the trauma therapist community. Thanks so much for your support. Hope to see you there. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.